Good day, two wheel friends, Zach Gortz here with Revzilla and welcome to another episode of Daily Rider, where we learn about motorcycles as we ride. Our guest today is the Yamaha DT1. That is a 250 cc dual sport that came out in 1968. But of course, that's not just any DT1. That's the very machine that carried Ari Henning across Wyoming exclusively on dirt roads in a recent episode of CTXP. And then of course, he meticulously disassembled and reassembled it for an episode of the shop manual. So we know where it fits into Revzilla's history, but where does it fit into motorcycling history? Well, some people would say that that is the most important motorcycle that Yamaha has ever made. So we'll talk about that on our ring ding and ride to work today as we step back in time to the swinging 60s. You ready? I'm ready. Ding, 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 ding. Okie dokie, everybody. Before we get going here, a friendly reminder. This episode is brought to you in part by Michelin. Michelin made its first motorcycle tire back in 1897. That's way before the DT1 even. And Michelin has been innovating in the world of two wheels and technology ever since. More to the point, Michelin is a fan of Daily Rider, which means for every Michelin product we sell at Revzilla.com, Daily Rider gets a little bit of credit, which means the next time you need rubber for your sport bike, your scooter, your granddaddy of all dual sports, whatever it may be, click on the link in the description of this video, shop Michelin products, and you too will be supporting Daily Rider. Okie dokie, everybody. 1969, Yamaha DT1. Where to start? Well, it's pretty simple. <laughs> this is a 246cc two-stroke single. It's about as simple as engines get really as far as moving parts go. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, the engine a little bit later on. Uh, you'll see it says 1000 cc's right here, but of course that's how much oil the transmission takes. You got an 18 inch wheel out back, you've got 19 in the front, and uh, stock DT1 has a uh, fork mounted fender down here. But if you saw CTXP, you saw that Ari Henning had some trouble with that mud in Wyoming. <laughs> so when he rebuilt the bike for the shop manual, uh, he did a frame mounted fender to make it a little bit more dirt oriented. Fun piece of Easter egg trivia. You may have noticed in the CTXP episode that our crew called us the Golden Boys. And that's because both this bike and the XL350 in the episode had these Golden Boy trail tires on them. <laughs> So we were the golden boys, not necessarily because of the sweet gold paint. Yeah, aside from that, stone simple motorcycle. Engine, wheels, handlebar, and a seat. So let's hit the road and see what it's like to ride, right, everybody? Okay. Ignition's already on, fuel on. Let's see how we do here. <laughs> That's that Ari Henning two-stroke tune, everybody. The man knows his way around a shop. All right, let's roll. All right, we can talk about specs as is customary here on Daily Rider. Like I said, 246 cc single cylinder engine. Uh, it was rated for 18 and one half horsepower at 6,000 RPM, when it was new anyway, which this engine basically is, I don't know, yeah, rebuilt by my friend Ari, so pretty much new. On the Daily Rider scales, it weighed in at 260 pounds, and that is with just about a full tank of two and a half gallons. You'll notice in the CTXP episode, we said that this bike weighs approximately as much as a modern dual sport. It weighs a little more, if we're honest, but kind of in the noise, considering how simple it was way back in the day. All right, left hand out to signal, which is more than I can say for this caravan. Son of a peach. Uh, anywho, we're going to turn left here because we're not going to take the freeway to work on the DT1. You will understand why. It can go freeway speeds just about, but uh, we're not going to do that. All right, off we go. Let's see if we can get that first to second gear shift. It's a little, uh, it's a little sticky sometimes. Come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. There we go. Second gear. Anywho, back to specs. The seat height is listed at 32 inches. I think it feels a little bit shorter than that, probably just because the standover height is real narrow on this bike. And as for price, well, that's gonna depend on what kind of DT1 you find these days. Way back when, MSRP was between 550 and $700 based on the research 
that I did. Uh, I didn't actually find a stated MSRP from Yamaha for 1968 or 69. At any rate, it was around 700 bucks. This one was purchased for $1,600 for that TTXP episode, and it needed a lot of work. There he went through it with, uh, I mean, not even a fine tooth comb, but had to end up splitting the cases and get a spare engine and cobbled together a transmission, which are notoriously bad. And he put a fresh piston in it at the beginning of the ride, which is amazing considering what it looked like when it came out. Perhaps he watched the shop manual. The point is, it took a lot. Really cherry versions of a DT1 I've seen sell for as much as 6,000 or 6,500 bucks that are in sort of showroom condition because it's an awfully important bike for Yamaha, as we said, and as we'll talk about later. As for what this uh, little sucker feels to sit on, um, like I said, the seat height feels a little lower than um, than the stated 32 inches. To me, the seat's fairly wide, especially for modern dual sports just have such narrow little dirt bike seats. This one's pretty wide. It's not plush. The foam is definitely old and tired. <laughs> But in general, the riding position is pretty comfortable. The foot pegs feel kind of high because it was supposed to be a performance off-road motorcycle of the time anyway. And the handlebar feels quite wide as well, especially considering how narrow the gas tank is and how just small the bike is here. Uh, you have this like big kind of wide uh, grip, which uh, isn't the worst thing, you know, for uh, control in any kind of situation you might get yourself into on this bike. So why is this bike so important to Yamaha? We should probably cover that up front a little bit since I promised we would talk about it. You see, before bikes like the DT1 or even before the DT1 period, a dual sport in the world of motorcycling didn't really exist. That wasn't a thing that happened. You had sort of hardcore off-road bikes, most of which were European like CZ or Montessa or Boltaco, or Husqvarna, stuff like that. And then you had scramblers, you know, because desert racing was a big thing in the, um, I guess the late 50s and especially in the 60s. That type of bike was very much a street bike with maybe some bigger wheels, knobby tires, a high pipe, sort of what you think of as a retro styled scrambler bike nowadays. They were standard motorcycles that were sent off road. So when Yamaha came out with this bike, it was just simple, it was inexpensive, it was easy to work on, and you could go out and keep up with just about anybody on any bike in an off-road situation. It was, I mean, the floodgates absolutely open. And they, the first run of 8,000 or 12,000 of these bikes that Yamaha made sold basically immediately. They just absolutely flew off showroom floors. It was a massive success right out of the gate. And then some numbers uh, suggest that Yamaha sold as many as 50,000 DT1s in the first year that the bike was for sale, which was just, I mean, it's a staggering number now, but back then, really even more so. Just an amazing, amazing success uh, for Yamaha. Long story short, perhaps, the reason it's such an important machine for Yamaha was that it created a category that all of a sudden every other manufacturer was chasing, and it put Yamaha on the map as a massive sales success and led to the YZ motocrosser. Um, eventually the DT got a mono shock instead of the dual shocks on this one. It just grew into a whole line of motorcycles that made Yamaha hugely successful. You know, there are other competing motorcycles in the running for most important Yamaha ever made, but this one certainly has its hat in the ring considering what an amazing thing it did for a relatively small Japanese company at the time. So as I already pointed out, and loyal Daily Rider fans will notice, we're not on the highway, but as you can see, you could basically go highway speeds if you want to. I'm not revving it out. We're going 50, 55. You could go 60, 65, especially if you had uh, the slightly taller gear ratios. This one has a shorter close ratio gearbox in it based on the parts that Ari had around when he put the bike back together. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you could go on the freeway. I just didn't think that it was really what the bike wanted. and. Um, I don't know, it didn't seem like it was worth torturing it. <laughs> and uh, plus these potholed industrial urban streets are actually a pretty good place for uh, a dual sport, as uh, we sometimes talk about on Daily Rider, even an old one like this. We're gonna hit some bumps here. Uh, the suspension is very capable, but um, certainly not plush <laughs> by any means. Uh, uh, it's got sort of large-ish wheels. It feels rugged and elemental and not ultra comfortable. But 
when you were turning along pavement like this, if you wanted to, you could turn right, as we're gonna do here, and then you could hook a turn down these here railroad tracks, and you could burn down a dirt trail. And as you can see, now we're burning down the dirt and we're going the same speed as we were on the pavement, same speed as traffic. <laughs> oh jeez. Oh, <laughs> and it honestly feels pretty at home doing this kind of thing. It's like good. It feels agile and like ready to take on whatever you throw at it. It's awesome. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> Splashing through puddles. Ah. <laughs> All right, back to pavement, I suppose. Sometimes, approximately in this point in the ride, we talk about the mirrors, and uh, the mirror mount broke for this bike, so I guess we're riding dirty a little bit. Uh, I do apologize about that, but I'm being safe. I'm checking behind me. I'm uh, trying to do everything correctly. So I can't comment on the mirrors on this bike. However, I'd be willing to bet that if you rolled one of these suckers off a showroom floor in 1969 and took it out on the highway or even a regular road at 50, 60 miles an hour, that there might be just a little bit of vibration in those mirrors, considering what I'm feeling in my butt cheeks right now. Another thing we talk about along this part of the ride sometimes is fuel mileage. And uh, if you know anything about how two-stroke works, especially an old and simple one like this, it's not hugely efficient. With a 2.5 gallon tank, we were going about 100 miles, maybe a little bit more. So what is that, 40-something, 40 40-ish, 40 30-something? <laughs> Obviously, it depends a lot on how you ride. And if you ride across horrendous mud like we did in our Wyoming CTXP adventure, then you will find your mileage will be much worse. Point being, it doesn't have a whole lot of legs. And I don't think that uh, anyone will be hugely surprised to hear that. All right, we got a red light here. We can. Uh, take a quick look at the dash, or can we? Do we have time? Probably not. Instead, I'll explain to you how I'm leaving uh, pretty much every stoplight in second gear because the shift from first to second or from neutral to second, more accurately, is um, very difficult. <laughs> so I'm starting in second gear uh, just to avoid that whole neutral to second business. And off we go. Uphill start in second gear. Come on, buddy. Yeah. All good. Got a little clutch slip. Okay, okay. Let's try to be cautious then. Try to be cautious with fifth gear. We won't really need fifth gear all that much anyway. <laughs> all right, let's hook a right here and get into the into the neighborhood and the stop sign challenge, which is going to be a real treat with uh, an ornery gearbox and uh, 50 year old fueling and controls. <laughs> let's see how we do here. Right, first stop sign. We need to use the rear brake, which works better than the front brake anyway. That's a full stop. I like it. Ooh, okay. Pretty smooth. Pretty good. Nice job, little buddy. Second stop sign. Nice full stop. Yep. It's up, seven up. No blinker challenge. You win. When you ride a bike like this, it's not about how good it is at the practical stuff, right? We talk a lot about practicality and usability and that kind of thing on Daily Rider because that's kind of my thing. I think that uh, people deserve to understand what's uh, what's easy and what's difficult to use about certain machines. This bike is a, is a museum uh, piece that we're riding around, right? And is the clutch particularly easy to use? No, it's uh, it gives you some communication, but it's, you gotta pay attention. Same thing with the throttle, same thing with the brakes, same thing with, I don't know, riding it in general, it's, um, it deserves and warrants um, extra attention uh, because of the experience in part, but also just because it's old. And um, I kind of appreciate that about it. And uh, maybe some of that uh, trials background in the DT's history of development is coming through because I feel very comfortable coming to a stop. Good job again, little buddy. Oh, it looks like the uh, needle on the tack spun. So it's at, we're at idle and it's showing like 3,500. <laughs> so uh, something's going on there. Uh, these are original gauges that Aerie um, rebuilt and repainted. 
so he won't be super happy that I'm messing them up already. As you can tell, not a lot of information here on the dash, right? You got a tack, you got a speedo, a trip meter, and an odometer. No clock, because who cares what time it is? And uh, yeah, no nothing else. Because this is a simple little machine. When you're riding through the neighborhood, it's going to be a little bit loud also. Corvette guy can appreciate that. Sometimes vehicles are a little bit loud because you have an appreciation for the, the machine. Am I right? Last stop sign in the challenge. I mean, that's darn good. Darn good. <laughs> All right, Lover's Lane. Uh, could you put a passenger on the back of this sucker? Sure, yeah. It just depends who you're trying to impress. If he or she likes old jeans and work boots and to roll their own cigarettes, then they might just appreciate a ride on the back of a DT1. But otherwise, it's not going to be particularly rewarding, I don't think. It's not luxurious. I don't even think there are passenger pegs, actually, although I'm sure that would be an easy fix. <laughs> Certainly built to ride alone here on the DT1. Oh no, the poor little tachometer is freaking out. Look at it. Oh no. <laughs> uh, this engine is uh, simple, not a lot of moving parts, but basically all the moving parts are consumable. And so are other pieces of the bike, I guess. Just because it's a pretty raw little power plant. All right, dipping into the twisty road section here. And I got to say, the DT1 is not famous for its paved twisty road prowess but I'm still a little ticked off that I'm stuck behind a Camry because it's surprisingly balanced actually this um, this DT1 it's it's not as kind of flighty and and unstable as you might expect a bike like this to be in this situation it feels decent it feels more agile than stable <laughs> I would say but it's not weird in any way which is um, Refreshing and cool and I guess it shows the the balance that a lot of machines had back then because I think it was before the real pushing of Insane boundaries of handling most of the stuff was just mistakes rather than engineering something incorrectly So when they wanted to get it right they did This bike is certainly much better than it was when we rode it across Wyoming <laughs> Eagle-eyed viewers of CTXP might have noticed if you ever saw a shot of Airy riding directly from behind or directly from the front you would have seen that the um front and rear tires were cocked. They were off <laughs> uh, because the swing arm was quite bent. Um, so during his ASMR rebuild of this DT1 for that episode of the shop manual, uh, Aerie got a straight swing arm and uh, tried to tweak the subframe a little bit so that it wasn't quite so uh, so off. And now it, uh, it feels much better, much more balanced, I gotta say. <laughs> Come to think of it, some of the on-road handling chops that the DT1 has could be because back in that day when the bike was designed it took a lot of cues from desert racing and hair scrambles before they were called hair scrambles Catalina GP and Elsinore GP was it Elsinore Grand Prix Elsinore Challenge whatever it's called god I'm such an idiot I watched on any Sunday like a thousand times how do I not know what that race is called anyway races like that often included little jaunts through town right you had to ride through the paved section and along the little road and then you'd dive off into this sort of enduro terrain with whoops and puddles and ruts and mud and all that kind of thing and um, you know the, the DT1 its origins reach back to Yamaha engineers taking YDS models and other sort of pre dual sport more scrambler style bikes to those events and trying to uh, compete and see how uh, what they needed to do in order to to win the the on-road handling ability might have something to do with that I suppose off we go here. Oop, I think we're in third, not second. There we go. There we go. I'm going to aim for our little pavement dual sport jump that we hit sometimes here. This tree root. <laughs> Good job, little buddy. <laughs> Good stuff. All right, approaching this red light, we can step on the brakes and grab the brake and talk about brakes. Uh, the front brake on this bike is pretty woeful. <laughs> It's just a little little drum up there and it does not do much. The rear brake for some reason is quite a bit better. So I like to use both in pretty much all situations. <laughs> and of course, stopping isn't really what two-stroke dual sports of the 60s and 70s were about. Let's just put it that way. 
it was a lot more about going than it was about stopping. So to circle back to the sort of thesis of this whole video to begin with, why was the DT1 so important to us? Well, it carried us across Wyoming exclusively on dirt roads, which is pretty cool, but it's so much bigger than that, the history of this bike. It gave a whole generation of riders access to experience the joy of two wheels and to experience on and off-road riding. It made it affordable. It brought the whole system of dual sport riding into the fold, into the spotlight. And in the same way that the affordability of the DT1 allowed all these riders to access it, at the same time, all that engineering in the engine allowed a two-stroke to be used off-road. A lot of those two-strokes back then were were sort of like um, real peaky, difficult to use, um, you know, high-strung machines. And, and this was engineered to just sort of lug along and slog through mud and down trails. And everything just became so much easier to to access and to use from, from a socioeconomic standpoint and from an engineering and experience standpoint. And that really is uh, why it became such a sales success and why a lot of people point to it as one of the most important, if not the most important bike that Yamaha has ever made. And uh, I gotta say, I feel uh, quite honored to get to ride one alongside one anyway, across Wyoming for that CTXP episode and, uh, and quite honored to get to take one for a spin around, um, around my neighborhood and on the daily rider route. And now the part that the DT1 has been waiting for all along, the off-road shortcut, which is flooded with water. <laughs> but look at it go. Yeah. Go, little buddy, go. <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm going to stay out of the puddle, sort of. Oop, we're going to go around the tree here. Go, little buddy, go. Woo-hoo-hoo. <laughs> yeah, we're slinging mud all over again. Oh my gosh, it's pretty deep. Oh, I hope there's nothing weird in here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, it's really deep. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Look at it go. <laughs> Incredible. A 50 year old bike, right? We just rode it across Los Angeles. And was it a little bit loud and clattery? Yeah. Does the uh, Kickstarter swing out annoyingly. Yeah, it sure does. But I mean, look at it go. It's basically unstoppable. <laughs> totally wicked. <laughs> yeah, little buddy. You look uh, more appropriate. I think all splattered in mud. I think I think that was exactly what you needed. Yeah. <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> now, will it wheelie this little bad Nelly? You freaking bet it will. <laughs> Look at it go. <laughs> I'm sure that's not the world's finest DT1 wheelie, but I really don't want to loop it out and I really don't want to torture the clutch because this little guy has worked hard enough. Just about hard enough for one day, I think. Okay, one of our last tests. Can you back it in? I'm gonna signal that we're turning right here. And then I'm gonna be very careful. <laughs> I got a, little, <laughs> got a little back in. Uh, two strokes are not famously easy uh, to, to back in in the way that I'm doing it anyway. Riding the back brake like that. And I can't get a lot of front brake pressure, but let's try it one more time. One more time for this transmission, buddy. <laughs> Very gentle back in. Uh, no ABS, as you might um, might be familiar. <laughs> up, up, up. Running out of gas. That's good timing. Flipped the nozzle from from on to reserve. There's no fuel gauge either. Just uh, just so you know, uh, in case you were expecting a fuel gauge on the DT1. <laughs> Time for the U-turn challenge, and I have a feeling the DT1 is gonna crush it. We've only got two parking spaces to work with, and that's gonna be more than we need. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we go full lock to the left. 
feet up. Ooh, yes. Uh, I mean, that was less than one and a half. Very, very good. <laughs> what a cool little bike. That's that's the word. That's the word that I that I have to use, that I have to come back to with this bike. It's cool. It is, it might be the epitome of cool, right? Look at it. <laughs> Way too cool. <laughs> it's a piece of history that we just rode on Daily Rider. It's way too cool. It's so cool. It's so cool. That's all I can say. Good work, little dude. Shut off that petcock. And I guess we will shut off the ignition as well, which uh, goes like this. <laughs> so the key just falls out of it anyway. So I just jam a pocket knife in there and shut it off. Oh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I that was that was awesome. I had a blast. More fun than I thought. My jeans are wet. My shoes are waterproof, so that's uh that's good at least. <laughs> but uh, yeah, had a little bit too much fun. I'm gonna have to wash this bike off and myself as well. <clears throat> All right, let's uh let's do some let's do some Instagram questions, shall we? Okie doke. First question comes from uh, N. Gile, um, uh oh, oh geez, Jella Jella Rivelli, Jella Jella Rivelli. I don't know how to say your name. I'm so sorry. Anywho, this person says, what are your thoughts on commuting on an old motorcycle in general? Good question. I talked about the brakes being especially bad, and of course, no anti-lock brakes, and that's sort of what it's like in a microcosm. Everything is old and doesn't work as well, and you just have to be more careful and more attentive. Is it a more rewarding experience to ride an old bike? Sometimes, yeah. Would I get sick of riding this bike to work every single day? Yes, I would. And that will reflect on the leaderboard we do later. <laughs> but it's a good question from this person whose name I can't uh, seem to pronounce. So keep that in mind, I guess. You know, with any old bike, it's going to be a little bit more trying and it's going to be, uh, depending on the bike, slightly less safe, probably. So a good note. Maybe perhaps that's what you're asking about. Next question is from 4 by 4 by 2 who asks, which do you prefer to ride and to look at out of the two bikes? So the reference that I think is this bike versus the XL350 that I rode on the Wyoming CTXP trip that I've referenced a few times that this bike took. To answer that question, let's talk about that other bike just for a second. The XL350 is a four-stroke single-cylinder bike. It is slightly more refined, slightly uh, it's built to last a little bit more than the DT1 and of course has a slightly different engine characteristic It's also a lot heavier and arguably a little bit more comfortable So which one I would like to ride I think I mean this bike's fun, but the XL350 is a better bike in my opinion It's not as famous. It's not as sexy. It's not as cool I don't think but I think that's the bike that I would choose for that adventure again I thought it just worked great and it's a handsome old bike I think as far as which one I prefer to look at how could you not prefer to look at this thing? I mean, from the patina mustard paint, a two-stroke cylinder just has that look. Plus, the XL has a low pipe that comes up. This one has that high pipe. It just looks fantastic. This bike is the looker, in my opinion, even though I was glad I was riding that Honda. Next question is from Mark Craver, who asks, if this was your only motorcycle, what would be the first upgrade you would make to the bike to ease your daily commute? <laughs> so this is sort of like the, the first question there about what's it like to commute on a motorcycle. I think the first mod I would make to this bike is I would put like a number plate thing here, and then on the front I would write for sale, and then I would put it out front of my house, and whatever money I got for it, I would use to buy a bike for my daily commute. <laughs> uh, which is to say, I don't think this is a great only motorcycle to ride. But, as much fun as I'm having, that did not answer your question. What would it be, Mark? It would be, I might try to rig up a better headlight. There, I don't know, just for the sake of seeing where I was going at night instead of this six volt thing, I think it is. <laughs> but there's a lot that would need to happen for that to be a good uh, actual daily rider, for being honest. Next question is from Eat Sleep Blanau. Blanau? Blanau? I don't know. Who asks, can this be considered the great-great-grandfather of the T7? That's the Tenere 700 adventure bike. Kind of, right? I didn't title the video that way 
for nothing. Yeah, it kind of can be considered the great-grandfather, right? I mean, is there any actual connection between this bike and that bike from the standpoint of engineering? Not really, but the whole idea of using a bike on-road and using it off-road certainly permeated motorcycle culture in part because of this bike and arguably one of the reasons that the BMW R80 GS existed ever was this bike arguably and i would say the bmw r80 gs is the sort of great grandfather to the tannery 700 although they're from different families and so yeah you kind of can draw that family line and that's pretty cool right that's again if you want to make that connection then it's another brick in the wall of this bike being one of the most important that yamaha has ever made it's a good question last question is from brickhouse builds who asks what style taco pairs well with this bike's flavor and feel. What kind of taco would pair well with this bike? Hmm, let's see here, let's see here, let's see. You want something that's got a lot of flavor, but it's pretty simple. I'm gonna go with a spicy chorizo taco, nice and simple. Spicy chorizo on a street style tortilla, nice and small, and just a little bit of like, I don't know, cilantro and onion or like some pico or just barely anything else on it. You want simplicity and you want lots of flavor. That's what this bike is. It is stone simple, but the feels hit you real hard. <laughs> Riding this bike to a taco stand and getting a nice spicy chorizo taco I think would be quite good in my opinion. Okay, everybody. Great questions. Thank you so much for asking them and paying attention to Daily Rider. Stick with me. Let's put this sucker on the Daily Rider leaderboard. Alrighty, here we are at the Daily Rider leaderboards. Um, and we can talk about that ride across Los Angeles on the Yamaha DT1, the seminal DT1. Uh, I, I, as I said, I hope you got a kick out of that. I thought that was a real a real hoot. <laughs> uh, so if you're familiar with Daily Rider and the leaderboard structure, of course, we've got our archive boards over here, uh, 2021 20, and 22. And then uh, the 23 board is here. The Daily Rider Classics is um, where these vintage machines typically live. So this is the battleground in which the um, the DT1 will be thrust for this um, for this little shakedown. The two bikes we've covered so far in 2023, Suzuki SV650 Honda CBR 1000 Triple R. I don't think the DT1 is, uh, is as good as Daily Rider, certainly not as the SV. It's arguably a little more comfortable than a CBR 1000, but not much for, for other reasons, right? <laughs> Daily Rider Classics, um, just a, a quick rundown here. We have the Versus 650 Battletoad at the top of the leaderboard there, followed by my own daddy-o's BMW R80 GS, a bike that we just mentioned as the granddaddy of adventure bikes, and then Honda's RC30, that's the podium in the Daily Rider Classics leaderboard. I think that the DT1 is gonna be playing down here. Is it better than a Honda Trail 90 that we rode across Alaska? Again, uh, that Aerie rode across Alaska, I should say. Um, I think so. The DT1 is, uh, you know, stronger packs, more punch. It's, uh, it can go faster. It's um, similarly uh, capable as far as on and off road, more so arguably. Doesn't, you know, fit in the trunk of a car quite as easily, but yes, it's better than the Trail 90. Is it better than uh, its cousin, the Yamaha RZ350? No, it's not as good as an RZ350. That bike was an absolute sweetheart. It was great for an old two-stroke, such a fun uh, daily rider. So is it better than a Jixxer 1000 from 2006, AKA Dave the Jixxer, the DT1. Is it, you think? Better than Dave? Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> this is where the DT1 is gonna go here, um, near the bottom. It is an uncompromising uh, machine. It is lovable because it is so unapologetically itself. You know, it's a slice of history. It was a real treat to ride. It was super fun. Um, it is not, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of riding a motorcycle to work every day, all that good. Um, but boy, does it have a special place in my heart, not to mention Aries, I assume, for all the time he spent with it. And yeah, so this concludes the Daily Rider and also concludes the journey of the 1969 DT1 here at Revzilla from CTXP to Shop Manual to Daily Rider. We hope you've enjoyed this uh, sort of immersive uh, two-stroke dual sport experience. Um, thanks for hanging out. As usual, hope you learned something and had fun and I very much hope to see you next time on Daily Rider. See ya. All right, little DT. Touching base with your dirt roots. I like it.